DCR, the local music and the latest from the charts. This is Terry Cleaver reporting for Burlable Community Radio and I'm here with Pete Burlable to talk about the history of the Burlables and his new book he has written. Hello Peter. Hello Terry. You've been researching the Burlable family history for a number of years. What made you originally get interested in it? Well, as a young boy I was always very fascinated by the stories that the uh, members of the family told me that uh, we were smugglers and indeed on a more higher level that uh, we had a Huguenot origins for the name. Sadly, that appears not to be the case. So how is the family linked into the history of the Dover area? As it has turned out, I think the Burbles, well, certainly those that this area are an East Kent family, though there are Burbles from France and doubtless even, even Holland. Uh, they've been involved in the whole of the area of East Kent and done some quite major pieces of work that uh, still, still live on and uh, with us. And indeed, those that have gone to Australia and North America have had roads named after them, housing estates named after them. And one gentleman has even had a, a mountain peak named after him. It's called Burville Point. So they certainly not only had a great impact here in Dover, but also across the world. And they certainly a globe trotting their family then. Oh, very much so. Having looked at this, uh, into this history for 20 years, indeed over 20 years now, one of the things that has struck me is how mobile people were. One has this idea that uh, a family lived in a particular area for decade after decade after decade, but the vast majority, it seems to me, were extremely mobile, looking for work, or perhaps running away from family problems, and they uh, went around the country, and indeed abroad. But of course one of the major problems was in, in the old days of the poor law is that if people moved from one village to another and the local authorities there that ran the poor law, these were the church wardens and the overseers of the poor, if they felt that these people were likely to be a burden on the poor law, for example, a single girl who appeared to be pregnant, they would be extremely fast in returning them to their parish of origin who had the responsibility for maintaining said girl and uh, the expected child. It has that happened quite a lot and through the research of the family history. Oh, very, very frequent examples. There was one particular group of girls who were originally in, in Dover. They then went off for, well, I, I can't actually work out why they went, but this whole family just took off. And they went to the Maidstone Cambridge area and the, well, then the uh, local overseers of the poor returned them to Dover. Then they shot off again, they went up into East Anglia and got returned from Norfolk. One, in fact, went off to Buckinghamshire and he got returned. They were described as knaves and, and, and the like. Clearly, people of not uh, absolutely shining character. But they all survived and uh, they came back to Dover. But it's that particular family, and uh, I actually describe them as the itinerant set, because the, the, the groups of burglars are uh, split up into essentially three sets. Well, the Thurston set, the St. Margaret's Bay set, and the Sutton set. And the Sutton set, which is the bigger group, I split into two. Uh, one I call the professionals, and they, they had 17th uh, century university graduates, uh, clerical gentleman, uh, sixth preacher of uh, Canterbury Cathedral, who was a lawyer, quite, uh, quite a group of people. They were the professional half of the set, and then there were the itinerants, and these were the mobile people. And boy, were they mobile. They, they really did just keep moving, and very, very difficult to track down. One of the major problems was, of course, that the spelling of the surname kept changing. These uh, people were illiterate, so their surname was just as the local clerk chose to spell it. And I've lost track of some people, and I think mainly because I lost, lost the name. Now, I should perhaps explain that this work is all done under the rubric of a one-name study. 
and it's registered with the Guild of One Man Studies in London. So I'm essentially just interested in people with that particular surname, Burl, and its many variants. So I only look at that. And when somebody moves off, the daughter gets married, changes her surname, then I, I lose sight of her. Occasionally I do follow paths and other names if, if the information is ready available and, and of significant interest I've tracked it a little bit. So I've just stayed with the one survey, which in fact has manifested itself in a lot of different forms. And what are the different forms of the survey that you've came across? And why do you think they've been spelled differently? The, uh, the, the essentially two favourite questions that people ask me, I in fact wrote out to all of the burlers that I could find in the uh, what was then the GPO telephone directory and asked them if they had stories they could tell me and, they, and their relatives got a, and set up a, a sort of network which spread out abroad to North America and uh, Australia, Tasmania, and New Zealand to gather this information and the significant thing there uh, with the different spellings was the uh, question of should the name be spelled with an E or without an E? And this, of course, is the terminal E. The other question was, what's the name of a Huguenot origin, which I mentioned a little earlier. So those were the two big questions. And the different spellings, it, it struck me quite early on in the research that sometimes some families, when they had their children baptized at the local church, Sometimes the name was spelled Burville, and sometimes Burfield, which struck me as absolutely peculiar, very strange. Sometimes it was connected with a new vicar that had arrived at the church, but sometimes it was spelled one way, and sometimes it was spelled the other. The vast majority that I've tracked have converted from this Burfield name to the Burville name, the Southerner. Some haven't, and in fact have stayed as birth fields, and I've, I've lost track of them because I haven't tried the birth fields as a, as a project. I'm leaving that for someone else to do. And that's because you're mainly concentrating on the birth field through the one name study. That's right. That's right. It, it's just the, the birth of name, but then essentially what I've found is that the, the uh, original name was in fact. Burfield. And that was defined as one of the uh, major objectives uh, of the research was to find the origin of the name. We had a lot of people contact you uh, about the history and the research of the family. A lot, a lot of uh, people. And the thing is that people tell their friends and uh, one gets that sort of connection back. And one of the things that I would like to do. Um, is, is to check. I mentioned the three sets that, that uh, have emerged. I would like to do a Y chromosome test on members of the three sets to see if we could connect them or how disparate they are. That would be a good project. I'd like to leave that to someone else. I, I don't know. But of course, it only covers the male side, and there are many examples of people with the surname Burgle who, in fact, uh, uh, I never were not signed by a man with the surname Bova. I think that I find the actual origins of the surname back further than the research you've done there. Oh, no, no, no I, I, I think it's quite conclusive that uh, the origin of the name is in Burfeld Manor and Tillman Stone. Uh, Burfeld Manor was a recently won largest manager and uh, then split into two into great and uh, little Barfeld and then subsequently it's, it's now known as Barville Farm which of course stands on Barville Road it, in Tillman Street. I think the, where the Barville Farm now is where the great uh, great Barville Manor was then on, on the opposite side of the road the opposite side of Barville Road is an area called the Rough and I did a geophysical uh, study there. As one does, no, we didn't have time to, I'm afraid. We did a geophysical study there, and we did not find any subterranean evidence for a building of any significance there. But what we 
did find was a lot of medieval pottery and small roof tiles, um, so small roof tile glass, which suggests, I think, that it was obviously a wooden structure that is where I think the, the two manners stood. So I see you've got some stories running down here. What is your favourite stories of the Bellevue's? I know there are um, many and <laughs> lots of stories and various fables down in the history. Oh, yes. The, the, the one that I was brought up with that, that I can remember most vividly was the story about this Berber who was a carrier. And he had his daughter with him and his horse and cart coming back from Beale to Dover and they got to Oxley Bottom. And of course, that is a, a, a place famed for its mists and highwaymen and, and the like. And sure enough, a highwayman appeared. And, Wished to inspect the uh, carrier's cargo, and the carrier wasn't too keen to do that. And uh, said he wasn't going to do that, so the said highwayman fired his pistol in the air, the, the carrier's horse shied, and the poor old boy fell back off the seat of the, uh, of the car and, and knocked his head. But of course, the brave daughter galloped off to Dover, but sadly, when she got to Dover, her, her father had died. And that's, that was that story. And then in the Dover Express, I think it was about 1837, there was a record of a carrier called Burwell who was uh, carrying some supplies and he was going through Broadley's Bottom and he fell, fell off what is called the float. I think that's a bit, a, a bit of a flexible seat that uh, people used to have as a sort of an outrigger on a cart. And he fell, knocked his head, and sadly when he got to Dover, when he got him to the Dover Hospital, he was pronounced dead. And it said in there that he lived in the caves under the cliff. That gentleman features very much in uh, our earlier book, the, uh, the one that you have here in front of you, the white cliffs of Dover, images of a cliff and saw in which there are illustrations of his cave. Could you tell us a little bit about how you went about researching uh, that story and producing the book, The White Cliffs of Dover? Well, The White Cliffs of Dover book came out of the voluntary work that my wife, Julie, and I do at the uh, Dover Museum. And the museum people there were extremely helpful and supportive in, in us putting together a set of images with some stories and research that we found. And that book is, it, it does refer to some bubbles, but the main aspect of it is it's about the local area, about the cliffs and what happens on the, on the shoreline. Because the uh, Dover Museum does have a wonderful set of images and uh, at the moment there are lots of volunteers that uh, are working with the objective of getting it online so that people all over the world will be able to look at those images and with each image there will be a description of some text which will tell people about the image and, uh, and those uh, features that we we'll see will be a very big resource for people to use that. Enormous, absolutely enormous. But, uh, it is extremely demanding for the volunteers and the professionals at the museum to get it all validated because what you get is uh, a lot of volunteers come home and put their ideas on there and get data attributions and the like. But all of that would be validating big tasks and extremely big tasks. And uh, I know from my own research is that how difficult it is to validate the, all the information that, that you have. But just talking about uh, the White Cliffs of Dover book and the shoreline reminds me of the other interesting story was that uh, I picked up was about the 13 Dover boat when they ended up in, in uh, Maidstone Jail. And these poor fellows had rescued a, a boat off East Cliff. What had happened? This uh, break was going down the channel, got into trouble on the barn bank. Managed to come back towards Dover, hoping to go into the harbour, but the conditions weren't right. And it was night time, which doesn't help. So the boat was actually run ashore on the beach at, at uh, Gary's Cliff. This is in 1859. And uh, the, the gentleman that was uh, in 
in charge of the boat didn't trust the Dover sharks. In fact, he was such a suspicious of the cove, he wouldn't even allow the coast guard, the captain of the coast guard, to go on the ship. So you can see that there was a bit of a problem there. And uh, eventually, uh, what, what really happened was that the group of these boatmen led by uh, the Burbell, Benjamin Burbell, took the boat round to the harbour and then claimed salvage. So we had to speak business about salvage. And I, I think he was poorly advised by his legal chappy and ended up losing the case. And in fact, the boatman ended up in jail because they had to pay a fine, I think it was 400 pounds, which was a large amount of money to find in those days. And the poor fellows were stuck in Mason uh, jail. But they, they were rescued by a fellow from uh, from Dover, there was a, 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 an old, uh, what do they call them, these uh, chaps from India. He was a sort of sea captain that had uh, done a lot of trading work. He finally got the, the poor fellows rescued. I thought that was a pretty sad affair. And uh, the following year, two of the boatmen, including uh, Benjamin, were uh, awarded a, a Board of Trade Medal for all the bravery they'd done in saving people's lives. So they were uh, sort of fine people, I think. But uh, there was a term called Havelling. I don't know if you've heard of the term. Oh, wow, uh, this chap called John Smith. His mother was a uh, oh, he, he used to love Havelling. He used that term. But there's a slightly naughty edge to it. If you, you go Havelling, then you, you're the right is to be uh, making the living as, as best you can. But strangely enough, the, uh, the term was also used in a legitimate uh, way. I saw in the Dover Express uh, from the 19th century about a lot of mackerel being called, and that was described as a good hovel, that was a good catch. So it, it's quite uh, probable that it's a Kent term, but in fact in North Devon, they also use, uh, use the term for that to ensure activity of, of people gaining a living as best they can. So there are quite a few fishermen in the family then. Oh yes, the, uh, I mentioned the uh, itinerants that were zooming off all over the place. <laughs> the the, the chappy that came back so recently at Hannah and then he turned into a carrier. And he was the poor fellow that fell off his cart and, and died. Well, his sons became fishermen. Doubtless, uh, there, were, there were work opportunities down there where they lived. Their cave was just uh, a little way towards St. Margaret's Bay from East Cliff. And uh, obviously, a lot of fishermen there, and that's where they became uh, a fisherman. Earlier, though, uh, the bills had, had been privateers. Uh, privateers, interestingly, date back to at least the Norman times. And of course, a privateer is really a, a legalized pirate, providing that uh, he does the piracy on the king's enemy. There's, uh, there's, there's no difficulty over, over it. And, uh, This chap was called Peter, and he was on the uh, ship called the King of Prussia. And you all heard of Thomas Paine, that famous revolutionary guy. Well, he was also on the King of Prussia at the same time as Peter. I have no evidence as to whether they actually had a chat about things. I thought that was quite a nice uh, coincidence. And there was another fellow from Deal at the same time. This is the middle of the. Uh, now, it's the late 18th century. He uh, became a privateer, but he, he was based down in, uh, down in Bristol, uh, a member of the Merchant Venturers Organization. So, he's down there. so a lot of fishing and marining was, was done, uh, done by the Burbells. A very uh, seashore um, living family, basically, then. Yes, but they, they uh, also went in there. What they 
seem like to have done is gone into big conurbations. They, they seem to like small villages. They would move from one small village to another small village. For example, one would expect here that in Canterbury there would be rather barbers because they come from villages around Canterbury. But there are very, very few. There was a chap called Hiru. This is back in the you know, 16th century. He, he was he dealt in strong spirits, and uh, after that it, it was a couple of hundred years before any of them turned up in Canterbury to live. So they, they were rural people. They also, as you said, uh, on the maritime side, there were some burgles up at the herding. If these these were burgles that at the time were also using the main bird field, but uh, they actually had a big world, uh, not worldwide, a countrywide uh, order issued by the uh, authorities up in London for his arrest. But uh, he seems not to have suffered from it because he uh, it apparently done some smuggling. The, the smuggled goods were being taken off him. And then he had another fellow black their faces and went in and took, took the goods back. So he's obviously a persistent sort of chap. He could take his goods. Now, are there a lot of persistent characters in the Burlings? Is, is there a specific character traits that you found? Oh, that, well, yes. I, I would think those itinerants were persistent. But they, they just moved in on other villages where they were likely not to be made welcome. What I don't know is, is what, uh, what their particular skills were. They must have had some sort of uh, uh, way of making a living or hoping to make a living. It looks as though it wasn't terribly successful, but they must, must have done a persistent with it. And the overseers of the poor persisted in sending them back to to deliver. But some expense, I might say, it's interesting to read how they were sent back. The cart carters were paid for, they got so much a night, it all terribly regulated. And there was a there was a persistence on the part of the authorities. The uh, one chap he, he came down to Hive. This is uh, the parent of the uh, the chap who became a carrier. He, he, he was part of this itinerant group, and uh, he got married by license, which is impressive because he was one the head. He's being moved on, so he doesn't become a burden on the poor. Or and then there's this marriage certificate saying that he's a, a farmer. So he impressed. I mean, farmers are quite rich people. But delving into the poor old records, it wasn't quite like that. What they did, the uh, high authorities uh, decided that this fellow should marry the local girl that he clearly made pregnant. I think they already had one daughter before they got married, and the, the girl was pregnant again. And they actually paid this money for it to be pursued and dragged off to the church. And uh, to marry the girl, which he duly did, and he, he was given some support, some support from from the court. But they obviously then decided they probably ship him out, which he he was duly shipped out of the uh, the cars. And uh, via Canterbury, he ended up in in Dover. So there's a lot of persistence on, on everyone's, everyone's part, I think. There's another example of persistence. There was a, by the way, was a, a church warden in Deal. And he and a fellow church warden were commissioned to take a girl back to her home village in Sussex, and they weren't quite sure what the name of the village was, because the girl with a Sussex Saying, would tell the local authorities where she came from because she wouldn't be able to spell the name because the village name might not have been that stable anyway because names weren't place names were uh, unstable to a degree. 
So you've got that persistence where the uh, small bell then had to go off. And the time of year was interesting because it, it was, I think it was in February, somewhere around there. Uh, and travelling conditions in the 19th century, it's before the railways were available, and the early part of the 19th century, would have been dreadful at that time of year because of all the rain. And that uh, well, really didn't really want to travel anywhere. But they obviously felt this poor fellow would have to go off and get rid of this girl that was going to be a drain on the local resources. <laughs> and how did you find out a lot of this research then? Well, the, 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 uh, it's family research. It's, I, I think the similarity is with archaeology and uh, you, you can dig around, and if you're lucky, you find something, and if you're unlucky, then you, you don't. But uh, the way I followed the past was it's not an easy way. You look at the telephone directory, where are the burbles operating now? Clearly, London, but then uh, that doesn't suggest the London origin. Unfortunately, I say there was a concentration in East Kent, which was excellent. So you start there, and then move through. When I started on this, this work, of course, all these census returns were not available online. It's absolutely wonderful now. It really is. The robot can, can find out. The big, uh, big problem with it, of course, is the transcriptions. When it's relying on the accuracy of the transcriptions of the information, and there are an enormous number of errors. At one stage, I started recording the errors to tell tell the people that it, the panel just got too big, so I just didn't have the time to do it. Uh, the weather wasn't the time, but there are a lot of errors. You have to use rather roundabout ways to track people down. The variations in name spellings are absolutely brilliant. Burrell is, is a typical version of Burrell, but it's just a couple of hours of putting the these in place with an R on the top. So that uh, and then there are the uh, local records. Canterbury Cathedral records are absolutely wonderful. And everybody's been terribly helpful in, uh, in uh, helping me to find the type of record that would be of interest and then to actually get the data. And the centre of uh, the, uh, the centre of Maidstone, CKS. Some of the county studies, they've been extremely helpful as well, a lot of records. But most of the uh, records of interest, they, they're not transcribed at all. So you simply get bundles of uh, documents, say, relating to house sales, land sales. You simply have to go through it. And, uh, it's a little bit sad, really. In London, I went through a lot of the medieval uh, records, the, these uh, and, uh, the, the taxation returns and things of that nature. But you undo these wonderful scrolls, and bits are falling off all the time. The, the wax seals are falling off. When you've had a day there, the uh, document table on which you've been working is just covered in these crumbs. Document crumbs, and of course, what really should should be done is that they should be copied, photographed, so that people can search search through on on the machine computers these days rather than the uh, projection things. But that that is is uh, a little bit was this, it, it doesn't add a, a nice sort of coating of gloss to a, a day's. Uh, Success when you found some records that were relevant to think that you've actually damaged the source from which the information came. But really, it's money should really be spent, I think, on, on preserving our records because they are irreplaceable. And that, uh, that all those types of documents. The uh, local director is quite good for the later 19th century. Uh, some 18th century records, local directories are good for saying where, indicating where people are following it up. But there's a whole raft of different records, there are some sets that I 
haven't looked at simply because of time. I have to make a judgment on whether you think the return is going to be best, uh, best achieved. So what has the feedback been towards your second book been like? Oh, people have been uh, very supportive. In fact, it's, a, it's, it's 584 pages and uh, it's an, an overwhelming prospect, I would think, to actually read through it. One of the major difficulties in putting it in the, uh, in the book was how do I structure all the information? Uh, that's, do I follow a particular line? And in the end, I decided I want a creative approach. So I, I started off at Folkestone, then came to Dover, and I gradually worked around the, the, uh, the coast making very salty in land where people who don't try and just write about the particular families uh, activities in places and then the, for people to follow their, their family there's little pointers in the chapters where people moved on to another village so that they could go to that particular paragraph in, in the village and chapter that covers that village so that people could actually track their, their family down. And as a help, I put a little family tree type of thing, not an exhaustive one, but one with typically around three or four generations of people so that they could actually put it together and then they could track it down. All the, the, uh, the enormous number of references involved in presenting the information and these I've had to put on a CD because I couldn't print off another 50 or 60 pages of, of references from the people who seemed to me that in the main people wouldn't be wanting to turn through references in, in hard copy they could look on the CD. And also the details of births, deaths and uh, marriages. That information I put into what I call family boxes and these are also on the CD, so people who get absolute details if they want it um, there, rather than trying to put lots and lots of dates in the uh, 500 pages of text. And finally, what would you say to people who are interested in researching their own family history or a specific name? Well, the, the, the bit I really enjoyed is, is putting it into a historical context, which, is, which I try to do. The, uh, this particular family, one of the some professional branch that I mentioned before earlier, they suddenly blossomed out. They were born as uh, sea captains, uh, military, military people. They were uh, they commissions as well as the uh, other ranks. They were really blossoming, and then along came the Commonwealth. And what impact that had, it, it quite interesting just to see all, all that in, in the records. And the uh, sixth preacher, James, he was at one of the six preachers of Canterbury Cathedral, he actually uh, left and went to Ireland to, uh, to get away from the problems. I've attempted to track his uh, life in Ireland, but uh, had absolutely zero success. So I did it both by a direct approach to the Irish authorities and to see if I could find uh, university research where this period was covered. People were always looking for research projects, I would think, to do doctorates and the like. I would have thought that there must be some published material on uh, the, uh, the clerics, the uh, church people moving to Ireland, but uh, I haven't, haven't found it either. There's someone else to, to track down. We wish you the best of luck with your continuing research. Thank you for speaking to us today, Peter. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for listening. <laughs> i
NCR, the local music and the latest from the charts.